All right. Hey, everyone. Thank you for coming out tonight and joining us uh, for another monthly data nerds. This month, we have Zach uh, with Juice Analytics, the CEO, to lead a conversation about five tips to improve your data storytelling skills. Um, hi, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Alex Antonison. I am the organizer of Nashville Data Nerds. Um, as I mentioned, we have Zach with us. He is the CEO of uh, Juice Analytics. Um, a company in the Nashville area that is a leader in providing data visualization solutions. Um, real quick, we uh, this month's sponsor is Antonison Consulting Group, which is my consulting company. Um, we provide business management, uh, process improvement, data engineering and architecture, and data science uh, consulting services. So if you're interested, please check that out. And two organizations I cannot ever say enough good things about. Uh, one is Nashville Software School, if you're interested in finding that second career or just leveling up your data science or data analytics skills, I highly recommend checking them out. Uh, another is Penny University. It's a community of people that we come together to have interesting conversations uh, about a wide variety of topics, um, ranging from data to parenting uh, and so forth. So both really good organizations. Uh, but without further ado, I'm going to hand things over to Zach, oh, sorry, I forgot real quick. Um, as we all know, having multiple conversations on a Zoom call is very difficult. Uh, so the way we'll be managing this conversation is that as you have questions or comments, please post them to the chat. And uh, as there is a logical time in the presentation, I will pause and kind of pose that question. Um, and then the last little bit is intended more for that kind of free form. I am recording this. Um, I will be sharing the recording after uh, once I process it. And if there's any resources or links, uh, I'll be sending up a follow-up message. Now I'm turning it over. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Alex. And um, I'm Zach Germignani. Uh, it's really good to be here and chat with all of you. Uh, I would definitely encourage you to ask some questions so I don't have to talk for 30 straight minutes and we can have a conversation about some of the things I'll share. Um, I'm going to jump right in. I, you know, what I wanted to do was, was share some thoughts about uh, this topic of data storytelling, uh, which is something that uh, I'm really passionate about. And our it's really important to our organization. Share kind of what that means to me and, um, and also take some time to just kind of take some of the things we've learned about data storytelling and, and share those so you can hopefully take away a few guidelines or approaches uh, when you're out there in the world and your job uh, learning and, and sharing data with other people. So that's what I wanted to do uh, as I jump into this. So, but one of the things, uh, I thought it was very timely this morning. I was perusing Reddit, as some people, some of you may also do. I found myself this early this morning checking out. There's this analytics uh, subreddit, and the top post on there. I was getting a lot more traffic than I than I'd ordinarily seen in the analytics subreddit. Was this question someone posed about how to become a better data storyteller? There were a whole ton of comments about it. And one comment that popped out to me was uh, this person who said this thread should never leave the front page. Storytelling is the ticket to promotion success and understand everything we do. I could not say it. Uh, I wouldn't say it as strongly as that, but I couldn't say it better. That's, I thought it was really great to just like see the energy around data storytelling um, and, and kind of how important this is as a skill to help bridge the gap of all the, the data, all the, the work and the analysis that you might do and be able to make sure that that makes an impact with the people uh, that you're working with. But, so that was, that was cool to see. Um, but I wanna, I wanna sort of get to defining the terms of what this means. Uh, some of you might be familiar with Hans Rosling. He, was, he became kind of internet famous for uh, a TED, a series of TED talks that he actually did 
where he was explaining um, development of different countries, but he did it in a way where he combined uh, graphics and animation of those graphics, but really uh, captured people's attention with how he made data exciting and he, and he explained what was happening and he told these stories um, using that data. So he he's kind of one of the, I think people maybe 10, 15 years ago, um, where they got people kind of excited about what could be done with visualization, especially as you add animation and storytelling around it. Um, another, so that, that's an influence and um, inspiration for us. Another one is uh, all the really great work that we've continued to see around data journalism. So the New York Times does a tremendous job of taking data and, and walking their audience through that data and explain and combining the story and the message with the visualizations. There are a lot of other great sources. Um, 538 is a site that, that we really like, The Guardian. There's a lot of, a lot of journalists, I think, have taken on this, this role of being really good data storytellers. And that's a, it's another place that we look at my company for inspiration of really effective data storytelling. So what, how I like to define data storytelling is to think of it as combining the, some of the techniques that we're familiar with in traditional narratives. So if you think about books and movies and the ways that, that we're normally to told stories, taking some of those techniques and applying them to communicating with data um, and doing that in a way that, that is really, there are some differences I would say between traditional storytelling and, and what, we, what we do in data storytelling. Some of that relates to the, the ability to interact with data in a way that you don't do in a normal story. Um, but really trying to kind of leverage those things that are powerful about storytelling and bringing that into how we communicate with data. I think it's about, it's about uh, thinking about your audience and what you wanna to communicate to them and, and what they need from the data. Um, it's about uh, not just, it, to me, data storytelling goes beyond just visualizing data. It's, there are a whole bunch of other elements. I'll talk about this in a moment. I'll show you some examples beyond just a series of visualization and really a story that doesn't lead to somebody changing their mind or learning something new or taking some action kind of doesn't accomplish anything. So um, really good data storytelling needs to be about change, uh, causing some change. Um, through that story. So I'll give you, a, I'll, I'll share a couple of, of examples and just to, to give you a sense of, you know, the range of things that can be done. Um, this is an example from the New York Times and it's a, it's, it's kind of like a, it's a little interactive tool, um, but it, it it tells a powerful story in the process of giving you uh, this ability to interact with data. So it's asking this question, um, could you live on minimum wage? Um, of course, it's a very timely. I mean, they did this seven years ago, but it's, it's pretty timely now. It's, a, it's, it's interactive. So you could, put, you could start to put numbers in here. Um, and as you do that, what you'll see, and I could put any number of unrealistic numbers in here. And maybe I want some food. Um, and once you once once you start to go through your budget, you can you can see you can see on the right the the money kind of shooting off into into nowhere and and before long, you get into this deficit. And that's, you know, so that's the message they're trying to convey is that you can put some numbers in here and, and, um, and you'll, you'll see what happens to that money and you see what, what happens to someone trying to live at that level. Um, so this is, you know, this is, I think, a good example of, a, of a, a very focused data story that has a particular topic. It's letting you explore with data. 
And then it's really, it's trying to guide you to some insight or some new understanding of that data. So I really like this example. Another um, totally different example that I wanted to share, this is something that actually someone um, at our company created, uh, also very timely with the, the cicadas coming out. Um, she was just really interested in, in sharing some data. She had come across a data set around cicadas. And this, this application walks you through um, a little bit kind of teaching you about cicadas and then showing where those cicadas are gonna show up by state, uh, letting you drill into this data and find out, you know, if we're gonna look at Tennessee, uh, we can select that and be able to see which counties are gonna, are gonna see those cicadas. It sort of walks you through step-by-step step an exploration of some data about, um, about where these cicadas are coming out, where you're most likely to see them. So, you know, this is a totally different thing, but also has that same nature of, of guiding you through the information and the way that a, a story does, um, trying to teach you something so you kind of uh, achieve a new understanding. So those are a couple of examples. I will, I will share these slides with you guys, and there's a link in there to a blog post I did a little while ago where I have a whole, whole ton more examples. Um, you know, I, I often find just like looking at other quality things that people have done, it's just a great way to kind of get inspired and understand what is possible um, when you're presenting the data and thinking about data stories. So what I wanted to do was, was take, you know, with that kind of sense of what we're talking about, uh, take you through a few different uh, things that we're always thinking about when we're presenting, when we're creating data stories um, and, and kind of share that, uh, those as, as things that I think apply in almost every case. So one of these, one of the really um, important insights for us as we thought about creating data stories is that you want to leverage what people already understand and expect when they're um, when they're hearing a story, so we all know there's like there's like this three act play structure, and and there's a reason for that. It's like really embedded in our consciousness that that we expect when we're told a, when we're given a story or we're hearing a story that there'll be a, a situation, a conflict that is given to us at the beginning of that story. And then there's this kind of journey that, that our hero goes through in order to, to, to grow and to understand and to, to become better. And by the third act, uh, that original conflict at the beginning has been resolved. So this is, like, this is like a pattern that because we've been exposed for it so, so many times, it's kind of inherent in what we expect from stories. So this is something that I think is a great way, it's a great thing to leverage when you think about presenting data. So whether you're doing this in a PowerPoint or in an interactive tool, you wanna to think about setting up the story with that initial context. What is, the, what is the problem you're trying to solve? What is your audience? What is their conflict? What's, what's the thing they need to understand? And then the heart of the data story is kind of where you explore that and you, you do the analysis and you find the insights. And ultimately you want to lead to doing something that's going to drive some change, as I mentioned before. So that, that three act structure is something to, to kind of impose on how you construct or, or design a data story. The second thing that I think is really important is this is is to make sure that you are um, bringing a, a perspective and an understanding of the topic and, and really trying to, in a lot of ways, narrow down what you um, present to people so that you're not just giving people a bunch of data, you're leading them to some insight or some action that they can take on that. Um, I've had a lot of I've often presented on this topic and, and sometimes with people who are data analysts, they feel like 
well, the data should just speak for itself. And um, I'm just gonna kind of report objectively on what the data says. And there's, there's certainly an element of that that you want to deliver. You're not trying to manipulate the data, but you're not gonna get very far if you don't think about what is the important business problem? What other things do I know about this data that isn't actually in the data? Um, what are the right ways to measure things? There's a whole bunch of decisions that you're making when you're working with data that should be bringing your understanding of the problem into how you present it. And, um, and, and kind of being willing to, to, to take your expertise and put it into the analysis and, and express that. I mean, obviously you have to be honest with the data and be truthful to what the data shows. Um, but kind of embracing that, bringing your own point of view, I think is very important. The third thing that we're always emphasizing when we're when we're working with people to present data is that um, is to get kind of as narrow and um, purposeful as they possibly can. Um, there's there's this problem that a lot of I think. Um, exists in a lot of reporting and in dashboards and the way pre people deliver data where they essentially just try to kind of throw everything over the fence and be like, here's all the information and it's up to the audience to figure out what's important in there. Um, and that nothing, nothing really comes of that when, when data is shared that way. So um, thinking about Go, what is that really key question that you're trying to answer at this point? So this is like going back to the structure of a data, of a story. What is the, what is the essential theme that you want to focus on for something? And, and delivering a data story or presenting data that really tries to be as focused on that issue as much as possible. So the analogy we'll often use is thinking about the apps that are on your phone. Each, each app that you have it's very purposeful. It has very. It's trying to do kind of one thing, and it's and trying to do that one thing really well. Um, versus having, imagine if you had like one app that tried to do everything. Uh, you know that would be very confusing and difficult to work with. So being really narrow and, and clear in what what your purpose is. I mentioned this that that. To us, data visualization is not, um, it's not, or data storytelling is not just data visualization. But there's, there's a whole bunch of additional things that, that can provide context and understanding around the visualizations. Um, so those examples I shared from New York Times and, and about cicadas, you know, there, there are visualizations in there, but it's the it's the description and the, and the story that you're telling and the way you connect those visualizations that I think is most powerful to, to carry along people through that information. So we're always, you know, we're always looking for opportunities to include images and videos and specific examples in your, in your, when you're presenting data. There's all, all sorts of things that are kind of the connective tissue that, that goes around the visualizations themselves and it makes it something that when you're presenting, it's something your audience really wants to go along for that ride. And then the, la the last thing um, that, that came to mind that I think it just comes up over and over again is how important it is to think about what metrics you're using in your data story. So. I'd, I think of the metrics as the characters in that story. They're they're the they're the thing that you want to see improve. They're the thing you want to see disappear, um, and, and you're trying to like understand those metrics. And you want to put a lot of thought into you know what is that thing you're measuring and what does it actually represent um, within the data. Uh, this is something for us as a company we've been thinking a lot about because we're trying to track kind of the performance of our products. So we're always trying to evaluate like what is the right way to measure, we're trying to measure success, what is the right way to measure that um, so that you, you're kind of reflecting the most important thing in your world uh, through those metrics. So uh, 
they're kind of the first thing you do when you when you're putting together a, a data story is often like what are we measuring what is the thing that's most important and, and really thinking carefully about that is is super important so i want to those are a few things I wanted to share. I was going to give you what I wanted to do was give you a little short demo um, of our of our tool juice box to help you see how some of these ideas of of data storytelling are kind of embodied in how we how we create things in juice box. But before I do that, I want to see if there are any questions that had come up. Yeah. So from Lavar, he had a question about do you have any um, good vaccine or public health examples. Uh, he is working on a public health issue uh, and he is trying to uh, navigate um, the, the political minefield. Interesting. Um, I would have to, it, it was interesting. We had a conversation this morning about, um, and I'm sure it's not the data that LeVar is thinking of. I had a chance to chat with him briefly. Um, we, we had done, like everybody else, we had created some uh, COVID dashboard type thing at the beginning of the pandemic. And then we were talking today about like, maybe we should have a vaccine view of the data and sort of that, that idea petered out pretty quickly. But um, I don't really have great data sources. I could probably find some, some good examples um, and share that when we send this out of, of things that I think are, are really effective ways of presenting that kind of data. It was, I misread it, it was examples. Okay, I will I will poke around because I'm sure I can I can find a couple and I'll share those with the things that we should we send out. Another question from Darcy. Uh, they asked, uh, could you give a specific example of how metrics are characters in your story? In my story, um, yeah. So. Um, so we're, we've launched a SaaS, a SaaS platform and, we, and we're getting people to sign up and the most important, and so the, we've done a lot of thinking about what, what is the best measure, what is the best metric we should be focused on to understand whether we're making progress and getting people to use a SaaS product. And um, we've arrived, we, we arrived at the measure, uh, weekly active users is what we've been, we, but we've been looking at but what does active mean and this is sort of where you dig into the the character of your character it's like okay so that's that's what we want to measure but what does active mean and we've been through a series of iterations of like um first we were measuring that and we had a we had a pretty good number of actives and then we realized we weren't measuring that right and we were kind of flattering ourselves by how many people were active this is very very common thing of people having um, vanity metrics. I don't know if you guys, if you're familiar with that term, but you know, metrics that are gonna, they're gonna make you look good, but they aren't, they aren't real. Um, so metrics do have the sort of characteristic of like, is that, is there an authenticity to that metric? Is it, is it actually measuring active users? So we had to kind of restate and restructure how we were measuring active users and, you know, I think it's it's been critical for us to be truthful about that because if we're if, if you're not measuring it accurately or really understand your metric, you're going to be making decisions that that aren't really in the best interest, the long term interest of your business. All right, we're good to go on. Cool. Um, so one one of the things I want to show you is just like so I, I, I've given you this sense of like data storytelling and and for us it kind of has this narrative flow to it we want we want to create something where you're walking through someone through the data telling help helping guide a user through the data and letting them understand it so what i want to do is just give you a little bit of a sense of how that looks in juicebox um, because there isn't really there are lots of tools for visualizing data for sure there's lots of tools for building a dashboard um, we've built something that really aligns with this idea of, of kind of guiding people through the data and guiding them to actions. So I wanted to kind of give you a real quick, I challenge myself to try to build something in five minutes. So we'll see, 
see if I can pull that off. Um, this is a this is my workspace. I've got a lot of things in here. One other thing I would say, um, just as a resource for everyone, um, we've created about twenty different data storytelling lessons. So if you are interested in any of these concepts or kind of how you can apply it, or you want to learn some, you want to learn about different chart types, visual design, um, color and contrast, choosing the right chart. We have this whole collection of these interactive um, lessons about data visualization and data storytelling. So you can, you can get access to it. It's on our site. I'll share the link. So if you, you know, if you want to kind of learn more, it's all available. All of those lessons have been built here in my Juicebox workspace, but I'll show you kind of how you build something new. Um, there we go. This is a little bit, it's like building, building a website, um, but with visual components and with the chance to kind of walk someone through the data as you um, as you present it. So I'm going to create create an app in here. There's there's my app. Um, one of the things you'll notice right off the right off the bat that we wanted to include in here is to sort of put in place this structure of, of, of an introduction, a kind of body to the, to the story, the, the heart of the story is sometimes we call it, and then the conclusion that you're trying to drive people to. So there's kind of three sections there. Um, I'm gonna load up some sample data in here. Um, a whole bunch of sample data sets in here. You can, you can connect to our sample data sets or you can load up your own data in CSV format. So I'll just, I'll just put that in here. When you add data to Juicebox, you're, you're effectively kind of, you create a series of what we call data ingredients, which are sort of the, the the components that you're going to use to, to start to visualize the data, and and you almost you always want to think of it like a um, creating a PowerPoint presentation where you're sort of stacking up a series of steps um, where you can you can visualize data, but you can you can let people also drill into and explore that data. Um, so to start with, I might say I'm gonna. We have, we have different sections in here. So again, there's, there's a little bit of a, we're very committed to this idea of, of like you're writing, if you think about like writing a paper, like there should be this structure, like these are the sections and then within the sections, I'm gonna have different components. Um, so I could, I could put a map in here. One of the things I'd have to do is create what we call a place ingredient. Gonna make that the happiness. This is a this is a data set we like to use. There is a survey of all the countries in the world and how happy people are in those countries. Um, so the type of thing we'll do is be like, okay, I want to look at all of these countries, but maybe I want to look at which regions are happiest or something like that as a starting point. And then I'll maybe I want to find within those regions. Um, which countries, you might wanna lay out countries and kind of find insights about um, which countries are, what correlates with happiness might be the type of thing that you'd wanna do with this. Um, 
an important thing we're, we're, we're trying to do is give people lots of space in here in order to um, talk your audience through the data. I think it's very, it's very important to give people the, to kind of, whether you're presenting this in person or you're sending somebody a link, you wanna be able to let them kind of understand what you're trying to say and how, how one part leads to the next. So, um, so you put some titles, you can put images in here, there's a bunch of things you do. Um, we like to, one of the, one of the nice visualizations that we like is something called a leaderboard. So often if you're comparing a bunch of things, you might wanna compare them by a number of different metrics. So I can take a bunch of, a bunch of the factors that lead into happiness and I can say, I'm gonna rank countries based on those different measures. Um, so I can see which countries are Highest on happiness, you know, Finland's highest on happiness, but, you know, not highest on freedom and kind of low on generosity. Um, so, and then Iceland has this other different kind of story to it. And the, the kind of the important thing for us is to enable this way of, of guiding people through the data. So if, um, if you're presenting this, the ability to kind of select select something here and have that dry. I can be like, I wanna select North America and Western Europe as, as the regions I wanna look at. Then I wanna just see those countries. And then I wanna drill in from there. That ability to kind of step somebody through something, I think is very important to an interactive data story. So you're trying to, you're trying to be a guide through the data on the path to teaching, showing them something that's that's interesting and actionable. That's kind of the essence of, of creating a data story. Um, so I won't, uh, I won't go any, I don't need to, I don't wanna make this entirely a demo, but just to give you a sense of kind of how, when we talk about, when I think about like um, how, you, how you structure a data story, we're really trying to give people that ability to say, to kind of, set up the problem and drill into the data and ultimately guide people to some insight about that data. And that's kind of, that's kind of what we're trying to make very easy in, in this solution. So um, with that, uh, I wanna kind of open it up and see kind of, I'd love to hear your experiences around um, visualizing data, your, the challenges you've seen um, and, and see if I can, answer any of your questions. All right, thank you, Zach. Uh, and yeah, we are now in the general discussion. So anyone feel free uh, to unmute yourself and uh, ask away. So I'll, I'll go first. Um, Zach, as far as the, the presentation that you were just building for us within the five minute constraint that you gave yourself, about how much time has your company had into building that product? Oh, we've spent, um, it's been a, a, a journey for us where it's a, it's a platform that um, it sort of evolved from a enterprise solution where we had built kind of a low code development thing where we could build we could build these interactive applications but it was really our team who could build those and had the had the skills to do it and really the the um the vision and dream that we have is is giving anybody who doesn't have you know people who aren't coders who aren't designers but do have data the ability to create really beautiful web applications for presenting that data. And that's so it's really been over the last couple of years where we've we've made the authoring environment easy for for anyone to use. And um, that's been really 
part of this is my thing. I've, I've got, a, we got a team of 20 people and I am like one of, one of three people who doesn't code. So, so like now I get to do it. I get to do the work instead of uh, depending on everybody else to put things together for me. Cool, it's really impressive. Well, it's free also. So you, everyone should feel free. If, like, if you're familiar, if you have, you know, if you're familiar with, and you, you worked in Excel with pivot tables, and I would guess almost everybody on this call has that level of skill. <laughs> um, it, you you have the ability to use it, so it's it's very easy and it is it is free to use. So you should sign up, give it a try. Free as a beer. <laughs> uh, this is Lavar. Um, what do you feel is the um, kind of the amount of text? that you need to use to describe the visualization? And uh, how much do you think that people read to understand or do they? <laughs> Gosh, Laura, that is, yeah, that is a good one. That is a good one because um, one of the things we have really discovered, we, we've spent a lot of time in the onboarding process, um, understanding how people use, learn a product and they don't read, which I think is what you were implying <laughs> that people, people tend to not read. They're only gonna read if they're like really engaged with something. Um, so, I, you know, I do, I think there's a, I think people, they're drawn to the visuals, right? And if you can capture their attention or they're good, or they, they want to spend a little engagement with that, then maybe you've like you've built up a little bit of time with them and attention so that they will go to that next step, step and read. I don't think people in general are just like in this day and age, just like meticulously read through something like that. So it's almost, you know, it's almost like can you can you capture their attention with a visualization that's really that intrigues them so they'll stick around to fully understand what you're showing them but also Thank emojis <laughs> oh. um this is a uh, felicia taylor i was interested in something you said about the resources regarding the 20 data story lessons can yep. you share that or provide that with me or yeah, absolutely you? um i have a pdf document that has links to all of those and I will send that document to Alex after this and be sending it out. It's, um, yeah, you should go just, it's all, it's all in there. It's a, I think a really, it's a lot of what we've learned about all this stuff and you can sort of absorb it on your own time. There are words in it that you'll have to read to look at. <laughs> Thank you. you bet. Back. This is Peg Duthie, and um, I'm wondering if you guys have um, done anything in terms of accessibility. Um, we have. It's a accessibility is a um, especially visual accessibility in a uh, visualization product is a is a challenge, right? Because um, there are. Um, I think the the primary path to take on that is being giving people the ability to extract the data so that they can explore it in a um, I don't know what it's called but you know a reading a reading device so they have access to the, the data itself so the ability to download data or extract data from from our applications is important we do have a I'm, I'm not the most well versed on our team but we do have a developer who is wildly passionate about accessibility so he's done a lot of work on making sure that things are properly tagged and stuff in our platform. Yeah, it is a challenge, so. There's no, it's sort of one of these things, it's like, I view it as like security is a similar thing where it's like, there's no endpoint, there's no completely accessible, there's no 100% secure, there's a journey to get better over time. Yeah, the pandemic seems to have made it more challenging because in addition to the visual, there's you know hearing and languages as well. So um, 
yeah, thank you for answering my question. Sure. Yes, I have a question. Hey. Yes, I, thank you very much for, for the presentation. I want to know um, how do you, um, it's a bit technical, how, how do your developers um, condense and integrate together all those reports? What kind of language do they use uh, to put? Because I understand it's kind of difficult to have, because just presenting us that PowerPoint, I mean, I've tried to, to check. <laughs> uh, there are a lot of APIs, uh, something like that. So I just want to understand you want to know a little bit about our, our like our tech stack and how this is i mean from a technical point of view how because actually the app is fantastic uh honestly speaking i just want to understand now technically how uh they they managed to compile yeah. all so you things. could so you can replicate it and put us yeah, out of business yeah something like that i can just do some <laughs> Uh, it's I, I mean I can give you some of the pieces and so it's all it's all hosted on AWS so we're very dependent on, on AWS web services the data that when we load data in into Juicebox we're doing that into uh, Google BigQuery so we're actually like cross cloud in that way but BigQuery we found as the is kind of the most scalable mechanism to just throw data files into we use a we use a library called SQL Alchemy, which has been very important for us as a way to be able to dynamically generate the queries. So as you're interacting with and exploring data in Juicebox, we're always, we're kicking off queries all the time because we want this experience of you select something, you see the results, you select something, you see the results. Um, so uh, SQL Alchemy does that for us. On the front end, um, we use D3 as it, uh, to some degree for some of our visualizations. Um, so it's all kind of JavaScript visualization. We use React um, a lot, but not throughout the whole platform, but the, the editing, editing stuff on the side is React. Um, uh, I'm missing an important one that I, that I forget. Uh, they're gonna be so angry with me. Um, so Django, Python in, in Django is kind of the, the middleware is the primary mechanism too. So there's a lot of parts, a lot of pieces that go into a platform like this. It's, it's not like, well, it's built in Python. Yeah, but there are a lot of other, other pieces. Thank you. So okay. what advice can you give to, to data? I mean, to, to a person working with data visualization, because I understand only taking a PowerPoint document is not, I mean, it's not really productive nowadays. So we need to have some analytical skills as well. So what kind of ad advice would you give to, let's say to an analyst to assure let's say the data simple and- No, I'd, I'd have them, I guess I'd have them sign up and use Juicebox because that's what we're, that's what we're <laughs> trying to teach people, you know, uh, I think one of the things that we were cognizant of is like Tableau and Power BI are, are super powerful tools. We sort of view those as tools um, when you're when you're exploring data. So that we may we sort of make this distinction between there's this stage that you often go through of exploring the data. You got a lot of data, you're trying to find what's important in there. But I'm trying to figure out what our best metric is for evaluating engagement. Like there's, there's that phase of things and Tableau in particular is this kind of super flexible mode. It's, not, it's like this Excel on steroids kind of thing, like a super powerful Excel. But then you, then you sort of evolve to this point, like you do that, at some point you need to start talking to people and sharing what you've found and presenting what you're doing. And that's where you need PowerPoint on steroids. That's when you need the ability to present that where the, the presentation and the message is more important than the flexibility of, of analysis. And I think that's, they're just like different use cases. And um, I think that a lot of people are familiar with kind of whacking around data in a, in a tool like Tableau. I think where, where there's a lot of room for improvement is like, how do you, 
present that data in a way that an executive is going to give you the time and you're going to engage their attention and they're going to be like, oh, that's that's really useful. I'm going to, you know, they're going to value the work that you've done at the beginning. Thank you very much. Zach Glenacre, I'm, I'm just curious about your primary audience. I mean, who do you think is going to be using Juicebox uh, to tell these stories? Is it the data scientist? Is it the analyst? Is it, uh, I, I think I've even seen a video of your daughter creating one of these things and moving forward. Who Who is this built for? Uh, that's right, 11 year olds. Is, is there, and then after that, 12 year olds. Uh, what we have found, the, the, the audience that we found the most this most appeals to our consultants who um, often kind of smaller consultants like Alex, let's say, <laughs> or uh, who are, who recognize that they're trying to express to their client that they are experts in what they do and they want to back that up with data. So they, so that, that time when you're trying to present and you're trying to convince somebody of something is something that people who are consultants are always thinking about and always, always doing. Now you can be within an organization and effectively be playing that role of a consultant. So you're a, you're a marketing analyst and you need to go to um, finance and explain the impact of what you're doing. That's a kind of a consulting role. You're a subject matter expert and you wanna go present something. So it's, it's people like that. It's, it's um, I believe the data scientists should be very interested in what we do, but I think data science, a lot of data scientists are, are happy being in the data and aren't as passionate about the, the communication or the presentation of that data to, to broadly generalize <laughs> for a moment, but yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Do you have any advice as far as like public speaking whenever you're presenting this thing you've created I know that's like a very broad question, but I don't have very much experience with public speaking. So just like any tips you have would be helpful. I, well, one of the things that I like to do, I, I feel like if you're really confident in your material, that makes a, a huge difference for me. It's always been the case for me. And I, and I, I used to be in consulting and I, I would, um, I used to be really good at PowerPoint was like my thing. I was like, super expert at PowerPoint. And I, was, and I think it was always like, if I could if I could really clarify what I wanted to say in the thing I was presenting, then it that helped alleviate some of that concern that I would be in front of that audience and trying to figure out what I wanted to say, or you know, trying to like work my way through or explain things or be, be afraid that I was boring people because I was um, figuring it out and my, my slides kind of didn't tell my story. So I've it's not the best kind of uh, presentation advice, but it's sort of what, what I feel like is, you know, you don't want it to be a crutch, but also I think the work you put in before to clarify your message is really gonna give you the confidence that you're, gonna, that you're sharing something that's important. That makes a lot of sense, thank you. Yeah. All right, everyone. Well, we have hit time. Uh, Zach, thank you so much uh, for leading this conversation about data storytelling. Thank you, everyone, for showing up. I, I always am happy to see uh, repeat people. Um, yeah, so as I mentioned before, all resources, I'll be working with Zach to get all those resources collected up, uh, linked to the presentation and a recording of this video. Usually it takes me about a week to get everything out. So I'll be sending that follow-up uh, email out just in a week. So. Thank you, everyone. Hope you all have a good night. Thank you. Bye.